How many times has this happened to you? You're trying to prove something in calculus or in analysis, and you find a statement that you believe to hold in a finite number of cases, or maybe even in an infinite number of individual cases, and you want to try and apply it to a more general statement about something that's infinite, right? You want to do the old yawn and stretch and reach your finite case around an infinite assertion and think it to be true. So you sort of pick your moment and you start to stretch and you stretch and then it's not there, right? This is what I like to call the local to global heartbreak or sometimes the finite to infinite heartbreak. Even if I have a infinite collection of true things, that doesn't always add up together into a single true fact that we can wrap our arms around. And this video is about why that is, and more specifically, why that is quantified on a property of the set on which that statement is quantified. So let's look at a couple of examples of something that I like to say is a fact locally, but is a fail globally. So here's where we're kind of gonna come at this. There is a problem that we'll understand in this video, I hope, about having a statement which might be true point by point, even in an infinite set, point by point in an infinite set, or even open neighborhood by open neighborhood in that infinite set. If we sort of do a neighborhood to neighborhood watch and say, oh, the, this neighborhood looks good, this neighborhood looks good, that neighborhood looks good, it does not necessarily mean that things are good in the entire town that those neighborhoods cover. So here's an example. Let's start out with this infinite collection of open intervals, open subsets of the real line. Uh, it looks a little bit strange how I've defined this, right? It's five over two to the n plus three on the left end point, 11 over two to the n plus three on the right hand end point. There's a specific reason why I've defined this collection of open intervals, um, but let's take a look at kind of what they look like. Right? The first one, u sub zero, five eighths to 11 eighths, looks like this. It's this open subset of the reals. Here's u one, here's u two, here's u three, here's u four. And so what you notice is that both the left hand endpoints and the right hand endpoints of these intervals are decreasing sequences that are limiting on zero. So my intervals are kind of getting smaller and smaller, and they're also kind of getting closer and closer to that zero point on the real number line. But they're always intervals of positive real numbers between zero on the left-hand side and 11 over eight is the largest that we get on the right-hand side. So this family of open sets is two different things. We're gonna let it play sort of two different roles here. The first role that this family of open sets plays is that these open sets are in fact epsilon neighborhoods of the sequence of points one, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth. So that's the first thing that I uh, took into consideration making this open family, right? Um, that U0's center point is the number one. U1's center point is the point one half and so forth and so forth. So each of these is an epsilon neighborhood of one of the points in this set of negative integer powers of two. In fact, not only that, these are epsilon neighborhoods that prove that this set is a discrete set. Right? That all of the points, one, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, and so forth, are isolated points of that set because these neighborhoods include one and only one of the members of that set. So that's the first role that this infinite collection of open sets is gonna play. It's an isolating set of epsilon neighborhoods for the set of non-positive powers of two among the real numbers. But there's a second role that we're also gonna look at this collection of open intervals playing. If I take all of these intervals and I take their union, so I just glue them all together, throw them all into one big bucket, what I'm gonna get is ultimately an open interval whose right-hand endpoint is over here at 11 over eight, and whose left-hand endpoint, because my left-hand endpoints of these intervals are a decreasing to zero sequence, um, and zero is their limit. The left-hand endpoint of this sequence of intervals is zero. So the union of all of these intervals, infinitely many of them taken together, is the interval from zero to 11 over eight, exclusive of both endpoints. Now that union happens to contain as a subset, the sort of continuous analog of our set of discrete points, which are the non-positive powers of two, right? Um, the interval from zero to one, which is inclusive of one, but which is exclusive of zero. So that interval of the real line is a subset of the union of all of these intervals. And so these intervals form what we call an open cover of the set from zero to one with one included, but zero not. Right? And by open cover, we mean it's a collection of open sets whose union contains this set from zero to one inclusive of one as a subset. 
So those are the two different roles that this is going to play. And we're going to see how, in, no matter which of these two roles is being played, that there is something that we would like to be true as a global blanket statement. And we can show that it's true in an infinite number of sort of overlapping cases that should exhaust the entire set, and yet somehow doesn't. So here's what happens. Let's take the discrete set of the non-positive powers of 2. We can show, in fact, we have shown in a previous video, right, that this is a discrete set. It's a discrete set because every one of its points is isolated. And every one of its points is isolated because every point, every x in this set, has an isolating epsilon ball, right? An epsilon ball around that point, which contains only that one point of our set, right? So u0 is the isolating epsilon neighborhood for the point 1 among the set A. u1 is the isolate, as an isolating neighborhood for the point 1 half, and so forth. Right? So this collection of open intervals are my isolating epsilon neighborhoods that prove that A is a discrete set. And that's what I like to call a local fact. This is something that point by point or if you like, neighborhood by neighborhood is a true statement. Each one of these epsilon neighborhoods is an isolating neighborhood for one of the points in the set A. So that's my local fact. So what global fact might I like to try to infer from this? Like, what am I trying to reach for in this analogy? Well, what I might be trying to reach for is not a statement that every single one of my points has an isolating epsilon ball, but what I'd like to do if I'm trying to be global is to reverse those two quantifiers and find an example of one ball to rule them all, right? Can I find one example of an epsilon, one radius, such that balls of that radius isolate each of the points in my set? So notice the important difference here is just the order of the quantifiers. My local statement is that every point has a ball, and this is true. Right? And my global statement is that there exists a single epsilon, a single radius, that can be used to isolate every single point in this set. And those are very different assertions. In fact, what we're kind of saying here, right, my global hypothesis, is that there exists a minimum distance between the points of the set A. But that's just plain not true. So here's a visualization of the points in my set A, which are in red, and the intervals, u0, u1, u2, and so forth, which are shown here in green. Um, and so the question is, why is it not true that there exists a single epsilon that can isolate all of the points in my set A? Well, you know, taking a closer look, what happens to my set A as we increase n? So the, uh, the u sub 1 has an epsilon radius of, I think I've constructed it to be 3 eighths. And the epsilon radius of the next one is 3 sixteenths. The epsilon radius of the next one is 3 over 32, 3 over 64, and so forth and so forth. So as these, as the n gets larger, right, my sets get smaller and smaller and smaller. My epsilon radii get smaller and smaller. And so if you insist on a single value of epsilon that's going to try to isolate all of the points in my set, what's going to happen is if you pick my value of epsilon, the radius of my epsilon ball, if you pick that for me first, it's going to work maybe for some of the points in my set to isolate them. But as soon as I've chosen epsilon first, I'm going to be able to find points in my set for which we cannot isolate them with that given radius. Why? Because the separation between the points in my set is becoming arbitrarily small. It's becoming arbitrarily close to 0. So we're never able to stop at some positive finite radius and say, this positive finite radius is going to separate all the points in my set. Because any radius we pick, even if it's successful at isolating some of the points, it's never going to succeed at isolating all infinitely many of them. So what's the moral of that story? The moral of that story is that we cannot get away with reversing the quantifiers. Just because this statement was true for each individual point of A, that there existed an epsilon neighborhood that isolated it, we cannot infer that there exists an epsilon that isolates every single point in my set. Our local fact was true, but the global hypothesis failed. So this is a first example of something which, even though we have an infinite collection of truths, we cannot glue that infinite collection of truths together into something which is globally true. We cannot reverse the quantifiers. Just because every x gets its own epsilon is not a guarantee that there is a single epsilon that all the x's can agree upon. In this example, it's because those epsilons got increasingly smaller and smaller and arbitrarily close to 0, but we cannot have 0 be a value for epsilon. After all, that doesn't define a, uh, uh, an, uh, sorry, an open neighborhood of x to have a 0 radius. 
to look at a second example, because ultimately we need to start really being able to think about functions and properties of functions in our course. Let's take a look at a friendly example of a function, kind of friendly, it's the reciprocal function, f of x equals 1 over x, as a function on the non-zero real numbers. But let's restrict that function to the domain, which is the set, which is the interval from 0 to 1, inclusive of 1, but exclusive of 0. So we're just going to take this set to be the domain of the function f of x equals 1 over x. So what kinds of questions could I ask here that might be locally true, but are going to fail to be globally true? Well, here's an example. If I take a look at how this function, the reciprocal function, behaves on each one of these open neighborhoods, right? I can say, well, what are the values of 1 over x look like? So if x is between 5 eighths and 11 eighths, for example, then since the reciprocal is a decreasing function, it means that the value of the reciprocal function in between x equals 5 eighths and 11 eighths is going to be in between 8 elevenths and 8 fifths. Right? So we know f of x is going to be greater than 8 elevenths, but smaller than 8 fifths on this first interval from 5 eighths to 11 eighths. And sort of we could do that for each one of the intervals that we're interested in. So here's the interval u0 sketched on the y-axis. And here's the image sketched on the y-axis of u0. Right? It's between 5 eighths and 11 eighths on the x-axis. Those are the y values of the points on the graph of the reciprocal function whose x values are between 5 eighths and 11 eighths. And we can make the same kind of statement about each one of these intervals. right? Um, for example, for u4, right, the x values are within this green shaded interval of the x-axis, and the corresponding y values are within this purple shaded interval of the y-axis. And what's nice about it right, is that we get a bounded on each one of these intervals, we can say that f of x equals 1 over x is a bounded function. For example, on this interval u sub 4, one, uh, f of x equals 1 over x is bounded, uh, let's say, bounded above by the value 27 or something like that. Right? So the moral of the story that's kind of emerging here is that on every one of these intervals, we can say that f of x equals 1 over x is a bounded function. Right? It's bounded from above. Right? And it doesn't really matter about the bounding from below. We care about the bounding from uh, above. So this gives rise to a notion that we might call locally bounded. So this is a statement which is true on every single one of the open neighborhoods in the collection of the UNs. Right? Every single one of these open neighborhoods of x values, when we restrict f of x equals 1 over x to those x values, the result is a bounded function. So it's bounded on u0, it's bounded on u1, it's bounded on u2, u3, u4, u5, etc. Well, you might see where this is going. The global hypothesis that this might correspond to goes something like this. If we know that this function is locally bounded, so my boundedness assertion is true on u0, it's true on u1, it's true on u2, it's true on u3, it's true on u4, and taken together, all infinitely many of those open sets are going to blanket all of the domain of my function from 0 to 1, inclusive of 1 but exclusive of 0. So my global hypothesis might be, shouldn't that mean that f of x equals 1 over x is bounded on the domain 0 to 1, inclusive of 1, exclusive of 0? Is f bounded on this domain? Given that it's bounded on each one of these green open intervals, and the union of these open intervals taken together covers the entirety of my domain. So being bounded on each one of the green sets, shouldn't that mean that this function is bounded on the blue set? And of course, because I promised heartbreak, the answer is no f of x equals 1 over x has this property that no matter how high I try to set a ceiling on the values of this function as we get closer and closer to x equals 0 through positive values, right? no matter what ceiling that I set for it, there's going to be one of these open intervals that on that open interval, the values of f of x are going to exceed that ceiling. And if I try to raise my ceiling again, I can just go to a later interval in my set and we'll crash through that ceiling as well. Right? So there is no way for us to set an upper bound on the value of f of x equals 1 over x on the set from 0 to 1, inclusive of 1, but exclusive of 0. And it's that exclusive of 0 part, it's the fact that we can get arbitrarily close to 0, once again, in my x values, that makes it so that 1 over x can blow up to infinity and not be bounded. Even though this function was bounded on each one of the open intervals that's a part of this open cover, bounded on here, bounded on here, bounded on here, because the bounds on each one of those subsets is different. Those bounds are getting arbitrarily large as we go through the, the u sub n's. 
that is kind of what makes it so it's possible for the global hypothesis, for f not to be bounded on the entirety of the domain. So this is the kind of thing that we would love to do whatever people do when they get their heart broken, right? The first thing that you do after you get your heart broken is you try to figure out, okay, how do I make sure this never happens again, <laughs> right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, maybe I should learn more real analysis. Right? So our next step is to figure out what is it about this set, the interval from zero to one, inclusive of one but exclusive of zero, that makes it able to violate this local implies global idea, right? Why does this set break our heart in a particular way? In the next series of videos, we're going to build up the theory for what kinds of sets are going to make it so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. So that an infinite collection of truths can glue together into a single global truth over the entire set. Those are the sets that we love to work with in analysis. We call them the compact sets. In the next series of videos, we'll see what those sets are and how to recognize them.